Hello everyone, uh, welcome at QSI seminar. Today we have a great honor to have Iwi Quack uh, between us. Iwi is a PhD student at Stanford and today she will tell us about quantum singular value transformation and how it can be applied for learning. All right, so thanks for inviting me and thanks you, thank you all for being here. Um, so. Uh, today I'm going to talk about quantum algorithms for, well, three quantum algorithms for learning on quantum data. And here, uh, I guess uh, a keyword here is learning on quantum data. So um, the, the input to these algorithms is not kind of classical data, but data that's already in a quantum form. And these three algorithms are the um, polar decomposition, the PETS recovery channel, and pretty good measurements. Um, and Something that unifies all of these algorithms is that the way that we implement uh, we implement them is using this uh, recently discovered toolbox of the quantum singular value transformation. So I'm also going to try and give a bit of a pedagogical introduction to it. Um, and also feel free to interrupt me with questions. Uh, yeah, this should be a pretty informal thing. All right, so let's start. Um, oh, how do I go forward? Oh, okay, good. Okay, so this is based on two papers, which uh, are also in the email that was sent advertising this talk. So yes, just to summarize, using quantum singular value transformation, we provide quantum algorithms for three theoretical tools. One of them comes from classical linear algebra, um, and it's called the polar decomposition. We can think of this as the matrix analog of a familiar way of writing complex numbers as R, a real part R, times a phase e to the i theta. The second thing we also implement is um, a theoretical tool in quantum information called the PETS recovery map. Uh, and this map can be thought of as the reverse of a quantum noise channel. And I'll be a bit more precise about that later. And as an application of these two tools, we also are able to implement pretty good measurements, which um, also appear a lot. They are used in optimal tomography, uh, algorithmic lower bounds, and so on. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with a review of block encodings and the quantum singular value transformation. Okay, so the problem solved by this QSVT is the following. Let's say that I have an arbitrary matrix, which is n times m, and I want to uh, transform a quantum state by left multiplication with this matrix. So how do we do this? If the, uh, if the matrix A is unitary, this is easy. We just uh, evolve the quantum state into unitary. However, we are actually also able to do this in the case when A is non-unitary, non-square, or has operator norm greater than one. And uh, the approach advocated by this quantum singular value transformation is to, um, is to embed this matrix A inside a unitary and then evolve with the unitary. So when you have a inside a unitary, um, we call this a block encoding of A. And uh, I'll actually show what the unitary looks like on the, sec on the next slide. Uh, and so that's the first part. The first part is that for many A's of interest, for example, A could be a density matrix, we are actually able to prepare unitaries such that the top left-hand block is A. This is called a block encoding. And not only can we prepare block encodings, we can also manipulate block encodings. By manipulate, I mean that given a unitary that uh, has A in the top left-hand corner, uh, we can actually transform that into a new unitary that has some function of A in the top left-hand corner. So this is what I mean by a block encoding. We say that a unitary U is a block encoding of A if the unitary has um, its top left-hand block uh, equal to A, and sometimes we allow a division by some scalar alpha. And the reason for this is because um, in order for something to be a block of a unitary, it has to have operator norm less than one. And however, we are able to um, do this kind of transformation even for A having operator norm greater than one. And the way we do it is that we divide all the entries of A by alpha first. Okay, so if we have a unitary that has this kind of expression on the left-hand side, um, just by linear algebra, if you write it out, we are, um, you'll see that A, has, um, A can be expressed in terms of the unitary on the right-hand side of equation two. What does this actually mean? It means that this unitary, which is a block encoding of A, implements A in the following sense. Okay, so recall that the original goal was to take some given input state psi and then left multiply it psi by A. So 
If we instead have a block encoding of A, U, what we do is we enlarge the input state psi by tensoring in S and psi in the zero state. And then now this enlarged input state is something that can be acted upon by U. And um, so once we act upon this enlarged input state by U, we then measure the ancillary, and if the outcome was uh, zero to the S, so if the outcome in the ancillary is all, if the all zero state, which occurs with probability one over alpha squared, simply because of the way U is um, written with, with the subnormalization factor alpha, this means that uh, in the actual system, uh, that contains a state that is proportional to the state that we actually wanted to create, which is the left multiplication of psi by A. So this is how you use block encodings. Okay, so that's the first part. The second part is that not only can we create block encodings, we can also transform the singular values of block encodings. And the way we do this is um, with the circuit that is shown there. Um, well, so this circuit is kind of like a black box. You tell the circuit what function you want to apply to the singular values of A, and this function has to be a polynomial. And then the circuit, um, uh, and then we can create a circuit that actually um, implements a new unitary U that is the original unitary U, but with this polynomial F tilde applied to A. Okay, um, and again, uh, we are often interested in A being a density matrix. So this means that uh, we start off with some unitary that has a density matrix in this top left-hand corner. And uh, we're actually going to um, be interested in this case later in the talk. So uh, I reiterate that when I write F tilde of rho, it means apply F tilde to the singular values of rho. And OK, so this is actually a pretty general method because uh, we usually are interested in transforming A by some function F. But as long as we can approximate that function by some polynomial, then we can apply this method. OK, so an example. Uh, so in this uh, example, uh, we have a block encoding of a density matrix U rho. And let's say that we want to transform U rho using the function F tilde. So what is the complexity of this transformation? It's actually measured in the number of users of U rho. And the reason for this is because if you look at the circuit, um, the circuit is a circuit that kind of stacks this original unitary U with some uh, other functions in the middle. So the complexity of the circuit is basically the number of repetitions of, the, of this unitary U, which is the block encoding of the thing that you want to transform. Um, OK, so what is actually the gate complexity? Well, this depends on what whatever function it is you want to apply. So if, for example, OK, so later in, when we're looking at a PETS map, we will actually want to approximate the function fx equals to x to the half. This is not a polynomial, but we can approximate it with a polynomial. Um, the polynomial is called f tilde, and the approximation needs to be good on the domain lambda min to 1. Um, and if the error on this domain is at most delta, then there are two parameters that the gate complexity depends on. The error of the approximation, which is delta, and this thing called a condition number. A condition number is something that comes from classical linear algebra. And Basically, it's telling you how difficult a matrix is to invert. So in this case, the matrix that we care about is the uh, matrix row. And the condition number is defined as 1 over the minimum singular value, or in this case, eigenvalue of row. So with these two parameters, um, for, for most functions, the gate complexity um, of this uh, singular value transformation scales as something like a polynomial in the condition number and log one over delta. Delta is the error of the functional approximation. Um, okay, does anyone have any questions at this point? Okay, great, then we'll, we'll move on. So the first algorithm we're going to look at is called the polar decomposition. And so I'll just introduce what the polar decomposition is. So um, let's say that I'm given some arbitrary complex matrix again. We assume that it's square for simplicity. It's the factorization of this uh, complex matrix into a product of an isometry, um, or we can think of that as a unitary, U polar, and a Hermitian matrix B. And this is kind of like the analog of 
z equals to r e to the i theta for complex numbers. So the polar decomposition is related to a more familiar uh, singular value decomposition. And um, whereas the singular value decomposition is like writing A as a product of three matrices, where you have kind of a unitary and then um, some diagonal matrix and then another unitary, the polar decomposition only has two um, matrices. And you can think of this, um, like the geometric picture of this is that uh, basically you, tra you transform some matrix into another matrix um, using only two steps instead of three steps. Oh, Marco's here. Hi, Marco. Um, so anyway, so the polar decomposition is something that, um, well, only has, it's kind of like implementing this kind of linear transformation in two steps, where the first step is uh, this B, and the second step is this uh, U polar, where the U polar actually does a rotation. So, oh, sorry. Um, okay, so the task that we want to do is that we want to enact the polar, uh, the polar unitary A of A on an input quantum state. Uh, let's say that we're also given a block encoded A. Then uh, in a paper last year, uh, Seth Lloyd and collaborators pr proposed an algorithm for implementing the polar decomposition that's based on uh, several classical techniques, called, uh, namely density matrix exponentiation and quantum phase estimation. However, um, we showed uh, that using the uh, QSVT, we can actually um, do the same thing, but it basically is a one-line algorithm. And the reason for this is because um, of the equation on the slide. Basically, if you know the singular value decomposition of A, uh, where you can, where the singular values are sigma ii, uh, well, these are the non-zero singular values, then all you need to do in order to implement the polar decomposition of, the, uh, the polar decomposition uh, unitary is to set all the singular values to one. And quantum singular value transformation is exactly a way to set, is exactly a way to um, transform singular values. So we simply apply the sign function to all non-zero singular values of A within some particular range. And this implements the polar decomposition. Uh, so this, is, this method is not only one line, but it's also exponentially faster in epsilon and uh, polynomial, polynomially faster in um, the rank of A and uh, the condition number of A. Okay, so that's the first application of the quantum singular value transformation. The second application is the PETS recovery map. And so now I'm going to explain what that is. So the PETS recovery map can be thought of as kind of a reverse of a quantum channel. Now, it actually can also be thought of as a quantum version of Bayes' theorem, and here's why. So in the classical world, you can model a classical channel as a conditional probability distribution that is mapping an alphabet X to an alphabet Y. Um, and of course, if you know two things, if you know the probability distribution over the input alphabet and the conditional probability distribution, which is a channel, then you can write down the probability distribution over the outputs. And that is P of Y. But you could also ask the question, um, given, this, given these two arguments, what about the reverse channel? What is P of X given Y? And the answer to this is uh, classically just Bayes, Bayes theorem. So P of X given Y is simply a function of P of X and P of Y given X. And then there's also P of Y, but that's a function of the, the earlier two things. So the quantum uh, analog to this is the PETS recovery map. So um, if we had a quantum channel instead of a classical channel, where a, classic, where a quantum channel is, a arbitrary, is some CPTP map, and we feed into the quantum channel a density matrix. And it, as we know, density matrices are the quantum versions of probability distributions. Then we can also write down the reverse of the quantum channel. And the reverse of the quantum channel is called the PETS recovery map, which we denote by P. And um, actually, if you scrutinize this expression, you'll find that it reduces to the classical expression in the case when the input density matrix is diagonal, which means that it's actually not, not a quantum density matrix, it's actually classical. And the forward channel is uh, some classical channel. So um, that's what it is. Uh, equation four looks very complicated, but we'll, we'll see that 
using the quantum singular value transformation, we can actually uh, implement this in a fairly easy fashion. Okay, so before that, why would you care about implementing the PETS map? Well, it turns out that it appears in many, many, many places in quantum information. Firstly, it appears as a recovery operation in error correction. Um, and, and this makes perfect sense because, um, as I said just now, the PETS map can be thought of as the reverse of a quantum noise channel. So it also appears in quantum information. So it, it appears as a decoder in quantum communication where it actually achieves um, the maximum possible information rate. It has appeared in quantum gravity in this application called entanglement wedge reconstruction. It can be thought of as a type of quantum Bayesian inference. Um, and this is linked to uh, what I said just now, um, where it's kind of like the reverse of a quantum channel. It's used as a subroutine in this algorithm for efficient Gibbs sampling by Brandau and Castellano. Um, and efficient Gibbs sampling, or rather Gibbs sampling is thought of as one of the most promising applications for achievable quantum computers. So the conclusion is that the PETS map appears in many, many places. So we're actually going to implement a PETS map uh, on a quantum computer. And what assumptions um, do we need in order for this? Well, we assume that we start off with the following quantum circuits. So firstly, the PETS map is a function of two things, right? The density matrix, the implicit density matrix at, at, the, at its input, which is analogous to Px in, in the classical case. That's, and so in the quantum case, we call that sigma A. And it's also a function of um, the channel N. So we need all these inputs. And we're going to assume that we have block encodings of two density matrices. The first being the implicit density matrix sigma A, or the implicit input. And the second being um, the channel acting on the uh, implicit input state. So this is kind of like the, the default output state of the channel. The other thing that we need is we're going to need a unitary extension of the channel N. So a unitary extension is kind of like a way of making um, a quantum channel that may not necessarily be a unitary into a unitary if you consider it on a larger input space. Um, and this kind of makes sense because um, when, for example, we would want to use the PETS map for uh, as a recovery operation, we could think of a setting where we have actually characterized the noise and we're simulating the noise using quantum gates. But if we are, if we are doing a simulation, then we're actually producing a unitary simulation of the noise. Okay, so um, actually I guess I should pause and ask if anyone has any questions at this point. Okay, great. Um, so we're now going to outline a three-step algorithm for implementing the map. So if we break down the PETS map, we'll realize that it's a composition of three uh, maps, which are overall trace preserving, but each of them is individually not trace preserving. So the first map is simply, um, so, okay, the input to this PETS map is like some state that's in the B system. Remember, we're trying to do the reverse of this quantum noise channel. We're trying to take B to A. So um, omega B is kind of like the input to this PETS map. Um, so we break down this PETS map as follows. The first step is to act on omega B by conjugation with uh, n sigma A to the minus half. The second uh, step is to apply n dagger to the result of the first step. And the last step is to conjugate the result of the second step with sigma a to the half. And putting these three steps together, we get the map that is written above, which is the PETS map. So this makes the application of QSVT uh, slightly more obvious. Namely, we're going to use QSVT for the first and the third map. And this is why I talked about um, block encodings of density matrices. It's because we're going to need to block encode these density matrices and sigma a and sigma a to the, uh, and sigma a and after we block encoded them we are then going to use qsvt to transform these uh, density matrices by fx to the, equals x to the minus half and fx equals to x to the half respectively okay um, 
there's also this um, there's also some things that we need to do in order to make it more obvious how to actually implement this on a quantum computer. Namely, we're going to need to be um, to write the second step of the map, which is acting upon it with the adjoint of the map, in terms of the unitary extension of the forward noise channel. So we do so as follows. Um, and this is kind of a weird expression because it's kind of saying that if I want to act with the adjoint of a noise channel, what I do is I act with the isometric extension of the noise channel on some enlarged input state. And then I somehow have to collapse it onto this, um, this zero state. Okay, um, well, the first problem is that the identity on the environment is not a quantum state, but this is easily fixed. We can just act on the maximally entangled state. Um, and if we write down the density matrix of this maximally entangled state, it's proportional to the identity. So we tensor in the maximally entangled state in an environment system with the omega b state that we actually want to act on. Um, and then uh, this thing is proportional to IE tensor omega b. OK. Um, OK, so actually, one, one second thing. Uh, another reason why this expression is kind of weird looking is because it only works if somehow we do a measurement, but then the measurement collapses onto the zero state of the environment. So the way we're actually going to ensure that the measurement collapses onto the zero state of the environment is by this technique known as uh, amplitude amplification. Uh, so this amplitude amplification is kind of like a, like a generalization of Grover's search, uh, where you kind of ensure that the amplitude of your quantum state in one particular subspace is is amplified so that it's close to one. Okay, we'll talk about that later as well. Okay, and then finally, we're going to rewrite the pattern in another way so that uh, the exact operations become even more evident. So this is the cross representation of the isometric extension of the pets map. So you're supposed to read this from right to left. On the right, we have the um, kind of like the first step, which is to tensor in this maximally entangled state to your system. And then we apply the first operation here, the second operation here, the last operation here, and then finally we collapse onto this environment state. Okay, so just to reiterate, this n sigma a to the minus half actually corresponds to the first thing which I said, which is conjugating the input state with n sigma a to the minus half. The second step of the PETS map is to act with the output, uh, is to act with n dagger. And we can do that by um, acting with the unitary extension of the map n, and then finally kind of collapsing it onto this uh, zero state. But note that this is not contiguous. So um, we actually have to do this uh, step two in two parts, where the first part just acts with the unitary extension of n. And then we do the third step, sigma a to the half, and then we collapse it. Um, so this is basically our algorithm. Uh, yeah, okay, so the, there's one last thing, which is that um, we have to trace over some environment E tilde, but tracing is just ignoring the, the state in E tilde. Okay, so um, here's an informal description of the theorem that we actually have. So recall that our goal was to approximate the PETS map uh, up to diamond distance. So what we are given is uh, some very reasonable assumptions. We have block encodings of the default input state to the map, which is this argument here. We also have a block encoding of the map, uh, of the forward channel acting on the default input state. And finally, we have a unitary extension of the channel, which we are going to denote as UN. Okay, so we can then achieve our goal with um, essentially dependencies on all of these things, but we're going to care about the dependence on this UN. Uh, and okay, so we can actually achieve the goal with uh, square root DE kappa N sigma users of this UN. Now, what are these two parameters? DE is something called the environment dimension. And this environment is basically something that uh, I 
briefly introduced uh, here. So this environment is the dimension of this E system here. Um, and it turns out that this environment system has a dimension that is at least the Krauss rank of the channel. So the Krauss rank of a CPTP map is something like a measure of how complex the map is. So it makes sense that the complexity of this algorithm should depend on this environment dimension. Now, the second parameter is this kappa here. So a few slides ago, I showed that in general, when you want to implement some kind of a singular value transformation, the complexity of that is going to depend on a condition number. And in this case, the relevant condition number is the condition number of n sigma a, which is one over the minimum singular value of n sigma a. So um, this dependence of uh, the number of users of the kind of like the forward channel on square root of DE times kappa n sigma is almost optimal. We're actually kind of like quadratically away from optimal. And uh, I don't think I'm going to talk about this too much, but um, the argument to show that this is almost optimal actually comes from uh, kind of like the Grover search lower bound. Basically, we construct a problem for which doing a search is equivalent to applying the PEPs map. And then um, based on the lower bound for doing the search, we can uh, conclude a lower bound for applying the PETS map. Okay, so just um, to go a teeny bit more into detail about the algorithm. So like I said just now, the PETS map consists of three maps. Maps one and three are just a matter of transforming block encodings. So for map one, we want to implement uh, this uh, n sigma a to the minus half. So we start off with this block encoding of u n sigma. We apply QSVT to apply the function fx equals x to the minus half to all the singular values of this top left hand block. And the complexity of this is um, kappa n sigma, number of users of this u n sigma. And then we just do the same thing for map number three, which is in green. We transform this block encoded sigma a by QSVT and we apply the function sigma a uh, fx equals to x to the half. And the complexity of this is kappa sigma, number of users of this block encoding of sigma, which is this thing here. OK, so the algorithm is as follows. The first thing we do is we tensor in a maximally entangled state. The second thing is, um, oh, uh, sorry. There's also this uh, other step here, which is uh, we, we apply this n sigma a to the minus half. I don't know why I didn't write that down. Well. Um, so that's actually, ah, okay, okay, sorry. So this slide is about how to implement the second step. Okay, so the second step is the stuff in, in yellow. Um, so uh, the first thing we do is we tensor in a maximally entangled state to the input state. And then uh, we have to perform the isometric extension of the forward channel. And neither of these steps requires QSVT. But then the last part of the second step is that we have to measure the system E prime and accept if the all zero outcome occurs. And, and then fourthly, we also ignore the system E tilde, but this is, like I said, just tracing it out. So um, how do we kind of um, make sure that the all zeros outcome occurs? Oh yeah, okay, so these, kind, uh, these two steps are not contiguous with uh, the first two steps. So we have to do this after map three, which, which is the map that applies sigma a to the half. Um, okay, so, um, okay, so I, I asked a question just now, which is uh, how do we ensure that, we, that the all zeros outcome occurs upon the measurement? And the answer for that is actually, we apply this thing called oblivious amplitude amplification. And um, the reason we need oblivious amplitude amplification becomes clearer if we write down the unitary that we have actually implemented up to this point. So that's this unitary. So this V tilde is actually almost the ideal PETS map. It's actually the ideal PETS map, but uh, epsilon away and diamond distance away from it. But it also has this uh, subnormalization factor, which is this um, gigantic number multiplying it. And this number is 
one over the square root of de kappa n sigma. So if we were to just um, in, uh, if we were to just apply the unitary W tilde right now, and we were to just measure the E prime system, then the probability of getting the state that we actually want is just the square of this thing, which is one over kappa times DE. So um, we need to boost this number. Um, we're going to use oblivious amplitude amplification to boost the probability of getting the all zero state. And we're going to do this by repeating W tilde, basically one over the square root of P success times. So that becomes square root of uh, DE kappa. And this is why there is a factor of uh, square root DE kappa in the runtime of this algorithm. It's because of this oblivious amplitude amplification step. OK, so um, actually, I'm going to pause again for questions. Um, does anyone want to ask anything? Okay, um, then I'm going to go on. So an application of both of the algorithms that I talked about just now, namely the PETS map and the polar decomposition, is that we can use both of them to implement pretty good measurements. So pretty good measurements are a type of quantum measurement that solve the following problem. Let's say that someone has handed me an unknown quantum state, which is drawn from an ensemble of states, um, each of which is kind of the state sigma j produced in probability pj, then what POVM can I do in order to maximize my probability of correctly identifying which j corresponds to this unknown row? The answer to this question is the pretty good measurement. Um, or rather, it's almost the answer, to, it's almost the answer to this question. It's a pretty good answer to this question. And um, it's pretty good in the sense that we actually don't know what POVM is optimal for more than three states. But if we apply the, the um, pretty good measurement, that actually gives you an almost optimal um, success probability in the sense that it's at most quadratically worse than the optimal success probability. And because of this almost optimality for this state discrimination problem, it actually makes um, pretty good measurements a ubiquitous tool, especially in proving lower bounds in quantum algorithms. Because um, there are many algorithms for which uh, they basically just transform the problem into a state discrimination problem. So if you have a lower bound for state discrimination, you have a lower bound for the complexity of this problem. Yeah, so that's what I uh, said. And um, some examples of this are the dihedral hidden subgroup problem, quantum search with wildcards, and quantum pack learning. So another place where PGMs occur is in quantum Shannon theory, where um, they are again used to approach the optimal information rate. And there's also this application called port-based teleportation in which uh, PGMs occur. OK, so I'm just very briefly going to talk about how we can obtain the PGM from our two existing algorithms. So um, it turns out that the pretty good measurement is a special case of the PETS map. When you choose the forward channel to be a partial trace channel, and when you choose the default input state to be some kind of state that represents the ensemble. And because earlier we had an algorithm for implementing the PETS map, so we can then make this into an algorithm for implementing the um, pretty good measurement. Um, the second way of obtaining the pretty good measurements is something that we kind of only know how to make it work when we're doing it on an ensemble of pure states. Um, it turns out that if we, it turns out that the solution to, uh, to implementing the pretty good measurement is a polar decomposition on some special matrix. Um, so based on these two algorithms, we, can, we kind of have two routes to implementing the pretty good measurement, but these two routes have different complexities. So in the special case when uh, we want to implement pretty good measurements on a pure state ensemble, it turns out that um, the complexity of the polar decomposition based algorithm is uh, scaling as square root of the number of states times uh, kappa of, uh, I think, sigma xb. 
uh, and this is a cubic speed up over the complexity of the pet space algorithm for this problem. Um, so uh, we, we an open an open and interesting question is whether we can achieve a similar speed up in the general case where we use kind of the polar decomposition to implement pretty good measurements, not just for pure state ensembles, but for mixed state ensembles. So that would be really neat. And, and it would be also cool to kind of contrast that with um, our algorithm from the pets map for implementing the pretty good measurements. Okay, so I'm going to conclude now. Um, the quantum singular value transform allows us to be systematic, rigorous, and fast in the sense that before this thing was invented, there was no general way of multiplying, um, of left multiplying a quantum state by uh, an arbitrary matrix A, or whatever tools we had to do this were pretty blunt and it was hard to kind of like chain them up and compute the overall error. But with QSVT, we can now do so in a systematic and rigorous fashion. And we've shown algorithms for implementing three tools. Our algorithm for polar decomposition provides new tools for quantum linear algebra and also speeds up PGM on pure states. Our algorithm for pet recovery maps and general purpose PGMs um, is, is one that implements some tools that appears a lot in the quantum information literature, um, but previously they were only theoretical, and this is the first time um, anyone has proposed a uh, implementation of them on a quantum computer. And secondly, it's almost, it's almost optimal in gate complexity. So with that, uh, I'm going to end uh, my presentation. So uh, yeah, I'll open the floor to questions. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. This was a wonderful talk. Um, yeah, lots of really new and exciting techniques. Uh, so do we have any questions from the audience? Yeah, so maybe I can start. Um, so a lot of these, yeah, so a lot of the techniques based on singular value transform are also pretty efficient in terms of the number of gates. One would yeah implement. Do you see any of the algorithms that you presented as potential applications for the early fault tolerant computers or do you think we would need like millions and billions of qubits to uh, implement them? That's a really interesting question and one that I've been um, thinking about a little bit. Um, okay so we can go back to the actual circuit that implements the quantum singular value transformation. Um, okay, so it's like, oh, it's all the way at the start. Yes, okay, so this is the circuit. So which parts of this circuit are not kind of near term? Well, there are several things. The first thing is that this circuit has a number of layers that is basically the degree of the polynomial. Um, right, because we have to repeat this, this unit like essentially d times, and d turns out to be the degree of the polynomial. So um, for polynomials that have a high degree, that's already ruled out, um, because for near-term corner computers, we, don't, we can't implement such high depths. And the second thing that makes this kind of a bit challenging to implement in the near term is that uh, we have these Toffoli gates, um, which, which actually are not just nearest neighbor interactions. So um, if we can kind of get rid of these gates, uh, replace them with something that uh, is implementable in the near term, and if we can, if we if there are some polynomials for which they have a low degree and we are, and they are still interesting to implement, then I think we can do this in the near term. But we have to surmount these two obstacles first. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so if anyone uh, who is listening would like to ask a question, just unmute yourself and ask, you can ask directly. Or if you are, you know, don't really, if you, yeah, if you are kind of shy to ask, you can also write a question to the chat to me and I can ask it anonymously. Hi, he hello. Hello. Uh, can I can I ask questions? So oh, yeah. go ahead. Uh, so when when the function you want to approximate the f um, is actually just a linear function, say 
some coefficients that you want to, I mean, just in front, some, some, some constant coefficient in front of the, say, the, the original U. Mm -hmm. um, and I noticed in, in, in the paper of QSBT that you have a, like a, a bound for the coefficients, which is minus one to one. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I was wondering, I mean, how, how, how does this bound works? I mean, if, we, if I want to, if I want to uh, impose a coefficient that is say larger than one, uh, mm -hmm. How do I do that, or can I do that? Uh, um, I think one thing you can do is that you can transform your singular values, not by so you say you're interested in transforming by a linear function. You want uh, f tilde sorry. to be a linear function? Uh, you, did, you, did you say that you want f tilde to be a linear function? Uh, or or I, I guess by linear, I mean I, actually I mean. Um, Say the the power of of a say the power of the original function, the, and the power is a is a is a constant. Does that make sense? So it's uh, hard to. Uh, like, could you give an example of the kind of function that you are interested in? Uh, yeah. So, for um, j just a, just a uh, uh, the, the the power of u u to the power of a constant. Say. Oh. Yeah. Oh, sorry. You want to like. Ah, okay, so you want to apply the function fx equals to x to the c, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, okay, yeah. so um, there's actually a lemma in the QSBT paper that tells you how to do this. Um, yeah, yeah, I, 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 yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So I noticed yeah. that in the lemma, there's a <laughs> bound for the constant, like c, which is from minus one to one, right? Mm. So if I want to do something like c is larger than one, and I mean, can I do that or I can't? Um, I'm pretty sure you can do C greater than one because we managed to do, uh, or actually, no, actually I'm not pretty sure. Yeah, okay, so I, I think you would have to find some kind of um, polynomial approximation um, of fx equals to x to the like 2.5 or whatever. Um, I'm not sure, like, okay, so whether you can do this depends on whether you can find a polynomial approximation. And so you have to look into the polynomial approximation literature for this. Yeah, I'm not too sure about that. Right. Right, I see. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. I guess my guess is that, um, you're only going to, like, because you basically have to get a good polynomial approximation on like some limited domain. So if you're trying to um, get a polynomial approximation on x to the 2.5 or whatever, it may be possible that you will not be able to do so efficiently in the parameters. Like the nice thing about QSVT is that um, we have a scaling in terms of log one over delta. Uh, but I think that for certain functions, you actually cannot get polynomial approximations whose scaling is not one of the delta. Um, sometimes it's like polynomial one of the delta, in which case it's, uh, yeah, it's not, not as nice. Right. And yeah, speaking of, the, uh, speaking of in this slide that you are here, like the, uh, the you're saying the gauge complexity, right? Uh, but yeah. the, in, in the box, it's like the, number of times that you use of u row, right? Not the gate ah. that is in, inside u. The yeah, so um, I think that it's kind of a, yeah, we're kind of using u row as like the basic unit of like complexity. So we're okay. actually writing down like how many uses of u row. And the reason for this is because there are many ways that you could create u row. So the final complexity is like, the multiplication of the number of uses of u row times how yeah. complex it is to create u row. But yeah, 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 yeah. that yeah. depends on what form of access you have to the density matrix. So that's why we write it in terms of the number of users of u row. Um, and then we let the user find out their own way of creating u row. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. I see, I see. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'm just, uh, I was just confused about the gate complexity because it yeah. obviously depend, depends on u, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Any reason you use the u to the p 
how, I mean, it's like a superscript of row, I mean, representing the, 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 the block encoding, right? Uh, like why, why I use U row? Yeah, to, 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 uh, to denote oh. the block encoding. Uh, because it's block encoding a row, in general, we can block encode things that are not density matrices. So kind of, yeah, the row just reflects the fact that sometimes I want to say that I have block encodings of two different density matrices, then I'm going to change whatever is here. <laughs> yeah, there's no real deep reason for it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Um, all right, so if there are any more questions, we can thank Iwi uh, again for the, this talk. Thank you.